This is going to be a phenomenal show, a really um, important show, I believe. Um, it has to do with music. And you, as you all know, music is just in me and a part of me and a passion of mine and, and really how I speak. And thank you, Judy, so much for um, setting this show up. Where did you find um, the, this program? What, how did you find this program? When I was a trustee at the library, I went to a conference 
and I um, discovered music and memory. And I went in and sat down and listened to it. And I said, oh my God, that's what I was doing for my dad. I was playing his favorite music when he had his hemorrhagic stroke. And I could see how people came alive when they heard music. And I said, this is for me. And I never forgot music and memory. And yeah. I contacted them when I thought of it as a program. And we're really honored and privileged to have Connie and Ann on the program today. Um, they have such a wonderful history and really a personal passion for bringing life and bringing joy and bringing um, humanity back to those that have suffered a stroke or a brain injury or even dementia, I read on their, their website. So we're gonna talk to them about that, but music is such an important piece of my life. Um, and as most of you know, um, after my stroke for two years, I couldn't sing. And that's the thing that ripped my soul out, ripped my heart out of my body. And why as soon as I got my voice back, I got into singing at nursing homes and rehabilitations and festivals and, um, it wasn't for me. It was just for me to be able to bring joy to those. I got to tell you, when I, when I was performing, um, especially on the holidays, because holidays are a really, really, really hard time for families um, that are suffering, um, you know, an illness or a devastating tragedy. Um, I know every single day is hard, especially through this pandemic, but holidays really are hard, especially if you lost somebody and somebody had a stroke or so I always uh, got booked at Preakness Healthcare in Wayne, New Jersey, which is a phenomenal um, organization. Um, but I want to read to you something that really touched me because it was a, a, a young woman who came every holiday just to see me perform. And they used to wheel her brother down in a bed. So you can imagine how heartwarming that is to me that they came to see me perform and bring some joy to them when they were in a bed. They wheeled the bed all the way down into the, into the, um, into the, uh, the, uh, the hall, you know, the ball of the lunchroom that, and it was a dinner. So she wrote this and she said, um, Merry Christmas. I just want to say how much I appreciate what you bring to these holidays. If it wasn't for you singing and uplifting energy, the holiday dinners would be at least for me, quiet, depressing. I never knew if it was going to be the, that. I'm sorry. I never knew if the current holiday would be my last with my brother. So I wanted to be sure you knew the, the impact you're having on us. Thank you so much with much gratitude. And as I was saying to Ann and Connie and Judy and Jim before, like, I mean, put yourself in their place. Your life could change in one split second. You never know it could be us in, uh, in that position. And that's what I always think about when I go to funerals or wakes, or if I go to a nursing home, I always think that could have been me. So that drives me to bring music and love and joy to the world, um, you know, each day, each moment. And I want Jim to play um, a video that, Jim, do you have it? Yes. Okay, so I want Jim to play it just to see the impact and the power of music. And then we'll get into talk to Connie and Ian, and of course, Judy, my co-host, um, and, and then the backbone to this whole uh, Stroke of Luck show. Um, but Jim, play it. I, you know, and the truth is, Jim, before you play it, I want to tell you, it's not perfect. You know, I always listen to my inner voice. And my inner voice before this telethon 2016 said to us, said to me, do uh, We Are the World. And nobody knew where We Are the World. I, mean, I was just, so all the singers that were there just took a piece of paper and they were reading the words. And it wasn't about being perfect. It was just about us spreading love and bringing joy. 
and and together that's the biggest thing that together we did this so jim can you show the uh, video And love is the key to find brotherhood, peace, and understanding and living in harmony. So take your brother by the hand and sing along with me. Find out what it really means to be young and rich and free. Let's go! I believe in music. I believe in love
We're ready to roll. Thank you, Jim. Welcome to Renee Marie Stokovac. I'm Renee Marie. And of course, this is going to be a phenomenal show, a really um, important show, I believe. Um, it has to do with music. And you, as you all know, music is just in me and a part of me and a passion of mine and, and really how I speak. And thank you, Judy, so much for um, setting this show up. Where did you find um, the, this program? What, how did you find this program? When I was a trustee at the library, I went to a conference and I um, discovered music and memory. And I went in and sat down and listened to it. And I said, oh my God, that's what I was doing for my dad. I was playing his favorite music when he had his hemorrhagic stroke. And I could see how people came alive when they heard music. And I said, this is for me. And I never forgot music and memory. And yeah. I contacted them when I thought of it as a program. And we're really honored and privileged to have Connie and Ann on the program today. Um, they have such a wonderful history and really a personal passion for bringing life and bringing joy and bringing um, humanity back to those that have suffered a stroke or a brain injury or even dementia, I read on their, their website. So we're gonna talk to them about that, but music is such an important piece of my life. Um, and as most of you know, um, after my stroke for two years, I couldn't sing. And that's the thing that ripped my soul out, ripped my heart out of my body. And why as soon as I got my voice back, I got into singing at nursing homes and rehabilitations and festivals and, um, it wasn't for me. It was just for me to be able to bring joy to those. I got to tell you, when I when I was performing, um, especially on the holidays, because holidays are a really, really, really hard time for families um, that are suffering, um, you know, an illness or a devastating tragedy. Um, I know every single day is hard, especially through this pandemic, but holidays really are hard, especially if you lost somebody and somebody had a stroke or so I always uh, got booked at Preakness Healthcare in Wayne, New Jersey, which is a phenomenal um, organization. Um, but I want to read to you something that really touched me because it was a, a, a young woman who came every holiday just to see me perform. And they used to wheel her brother down in a bed. So you can imagine how heartwarming that is to me that they came to see me perform and bring some joy to them when they were in a bed. They wheeled the bed all the way down into the, into the, um, into the, uh, the, uh, the hall, you know, the ball of the lunchroom that, and it was a dinner. So she wrote this and she said, um, Merry Christmas. I just want to say how much I appreciate what you bring to these holidays. If it wasn't for you singing and uplifting energy, the holiday dinners would be at least for me, quiet, depressing. I never knew if it was going to be the, that. I'm sorry. I never knew if the current holiday would be my last with my brother. So I wanted to be sure you knew the the impact you're having on us. Thank you so much with much gratitude. And as I was saying to Ann and Connie and Judy and Jim before, like, I mean, put yourself in their place. Your life could change in one split second. You never know it could be us in, uh, in that position. And that's what I always think about when I go to funerals or wakes, or if I go to a nursing home, I always think that could have been me. So that drives me to bring music and love and joy to the world, um, you know, each day, each moment. And I want Jim to play um, a video that, Jim, do you have it? Yes. 
Okay, so I want Jim to play just to see the impact and the power of music, and then we'll get into talk to Connie and Ian, and of course Judy, my co-host, um, and and then the backbone to this whole uh, stroke of luck show. Um, but Jim, play it. I, you know, and the truth is, Jim, before you play it, I want to tell you it's not perfect. You know, I always listen to my inner voice, and my inner voice before this telethon, 2016, said to us, said to me do uh, We Are the World. And nobody knew where We Are the World. I, mean, I was just, so all the singers that were there just took a piece of paper and they were reading the words. And it wasn't about being perfect. It was just about us uh, spreading love and bringing joy. And, and together, that's the biggest thing that together we did. So Jim, can you show the uh, video? Got it? It's okay if, if you don't have it. I have it. I just um Is it okay? I'm sorry, but I just bit with me for one second, okay. but I don't have the sound. Okay. Life is not perfect. That's the one thing I've learned that life is about plan B, not plan A. <laughs> Very true. Go ahead, Jim. Can, can you hear it? No, I can't. Can you hear it? Nope. I could see it, but I can't hear it. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Let's let's move on, Jim. We'll 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 I'll intertwine that the video into the show. So let's get to talking to um, Connie and Ann about how this all began. Connie, can you start for us? I know you shared a little bit about in the Zoom green room with me. Um, about how it began, but could you please tell our audience, um, you know, start with the start with your um, your um, your trumpet and your accordion. I think you said your accordion right. lessons. Start with that because that's you know that was that's what um, that's the big the 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 seed that was planted in you. So start with that if you don't mind. Sure. Thanks, Renee. Um, well, I had studied accordion uh, when I was young uh, for many, many years. And then when I was in high school, I joined the high school band and, and learned to play trumpet. Um, but my background also was uh, very much connected to sciences. So all throughout my life through undergraduate um, high school, I was involved in chemistry, biology. So I started in college as a pre-med student, but wanted to take trumpet lessons from the trumpet professor because I hadn't formally studied that. And here I am finding out that I have to be a music major to study trumpet. So I double majored in, in sciences, biology, chemistry, and, um, and music performance. And it was in my junior year that I actually found out that there was a field called music therapy mm -hmm. and wanted to see if I could actually pursue that because this was, would be a way of me combining my two loves of music and science to, to help people. Because that was ultimately my goal was to be in the human service profession. And so um, went right on after, after undergraduate to do my master's in music therapy at NYU and eventually uh, got my doctorate in music therapy as well with some background in neuroscience. Could you share with our audience, like, what is the, what is, I, I mean, we, we, we probably assume we know what music therapy is, but could you give our audience a clear understanding of what you actually do in music therapy? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for asking that because all of us know how therapeutic music is. I mean, we use it in our lives to help us relax and to help us feel good. But the field of music therapy is a formal profession that originated in the United States in 1950. And, and it is the use of music and the components of music to affect cognitive, psychological, physiological, physical function as well as developmental skills in, in young children through the use of music in real time with a professional music therapist. So somebody, when we talk about music therapy, we talk about an application that's being delivered by somebody who's board certified in music therapy. Now, uh, what we do know because of all the science that's gone on and all the research over these you know, 70 years or so is that music addresses uh, very specific cognitive systems, you know, cognitive uh, physiological 
involuntary systems in the brain that allow function to be addressed through music and, and even things like um, pain or emotional regulation can also be addressed through music therapy. So there's a really broad, broad spectrum of applications that can be um, addressed through music therapy um, in the clinical setting. And many of us, because of our training, end up you know, working with groups like Music and Memory and, and with caregivers and care partners to help them understand how they themselves can use music effectively to help their loved ones. Sorry, I had to shut, shut my volume, my voice off because my, I don't know if anybody can hear my dog. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> she's probably like, I want to sing too. <laughs> but anyway, so, so, you know, I know it's a, you know, I, I love the profession of music therapy and I wish I would have um, engaged in it at a younger age. Um, I guess it wasn't a plan. My plan was to be where I am today. And, but, um, but, you know, I was reading online that music can even music therapy, even for those that haven't gotten, um, you know, an illness or a brain trauma or something. Um, it even helps children in, um, in, in memory and, and with in, 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 in being successful in their lives. Can you tap into that a little bit, Connie? Sure. Well, you know, the, the thing about music, um, the components of music like rhythm, and patterns of sound actually inform the building blocks of developmental function. So for example, we know now through the research that children who have language delays, so children who have trouble putting together words or understanding sentences and you know, aren't really using their words successfully by two, three years old, we find out that they have poor uh, rhythm perception. They don't understand patterns of sound. Their brain just can't process that. And so we can use rhythmic-based activities to help them develop the building blocks of understanding patterns of sound, and that leads to the development of language skills. We know that uh, we can use rhythm um, and movement, moving to rhythm, to help people with balance issues or, or children who may be a little bit clumsy, uh, maybe their muscles aren't strong enough or whatever we can help them to build those skills so they can be effective in their physical environment. But also things like attention and focus, building blocks of good educational skills um, can be done through music-based activities because music helps people focus on a task for a long period of time and engage in that task using multiple sensory systems of vision, of movement, of cognitive processing. And so all of those activities happening simultaneously actually then help the brain develop more integrated neurologic pathways. And so those enriched pathways then serve the person in other types of, of mental activities throughout their life. Wow. You know, it, it's so sad because um, when, when a schools for budgetary reasons have to um, eliminate something they usually eliminate the what they call what they consider um the uh, activities you know but music and sports are such a critical yeah. um component to having kids grow up and educate them and i've learned the most lessons through life lessons through playing softball and through music than I have in the education field, and to be honest with you. That's, that's really true. And in fact, um, the National Institutes of Health, NIH, are, are really focusing uh, funding on looking at the importance of music and health and development for just those reasons. Um, the arts aren't just some superfluous activity that we participate in, but all the arts uh, involve us engaging with other people in a very important way and sharing our creativity and self-expression. And those activities are fundamental to human growth and potential. And so if we eliminate those at the expense of just, you know, science and math and reading, then we're losing the essence of what it is to be a human being and to be a human being in a social environment and to be creative and expressive. And so I think we're now learning uh, and hopefully the government and educational institutions are learning 
that the arts are fundamental to human development and have to be preserved as part of education. And the truth is that even as, um, even as a, um, a perception, right? Like kids, when they have to go to school, they're like, oh, I got to go to school. But when they're going to go play softball or sports and they're going to have to, they're going to um, go into the arts, that's like a different perception of what they're doing. So I hope that all the, all the um, coaches and all the art, you know, uh, directors would have the conscience that they're, they're doing as important work as the teachers in classroom, because you can teach the same thing through these arts and sports. Oh, absolutely. I think, I think the coaches and music educators absolutely know how important their roles are. Yeah. I think their, their challenge is to get the administrators to, and the people in town that, that regulate the budgets to realize how important that is. And hopefully families and parents will also advocate for their children wow. to make sure that those, those um, activities aren't they're not really activities. They're, they're a core part of, of, of child development. Yeah, yeah. Judy, um, I know that you were talking before about your father um, when you brought him, you know, you sang every day. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I used to wheel him around and I had a tape recorder with the 40s music and he loved it. And I would wheel him around the facility sometimes outside, and I could see how happy it made him. I also, in the evenings, took him to music, and he was keeping rhythm with whoever was singing or performing. So I got him, I think it's um, a tamarine, mm -hmm. and he was shaking the tamarine to the music, and the people that were singing were coming over and saying, that's perfect. <laughs> and I could see people in the audience, people who um, really couldn't communicate. My dad could communicate, even though he had a hemorrhagic stroke, but some of them couldn't even communicate. And I could see them coming alive. And when I went to this um, conference, I had no idea that music and memory was that important. And when I heard the the um, head of music and memory, and I cannot think of his name right now, but uh, when I heard his discussion, I was so excited about it that afterwards I talked to him personally and told him what I had experienced. And he said, that's wonderful. And I said, I can't believe I was doing what you're talking about for an hour. I was actually doing it and it made me feel good. And it made me feel good that he was enjoying it. And if anybody else was around, they were listening to it. And it really brought everybody alive and, and smiling. And that made my heart feel really good. No, well, you're a special, special person anyway, Judy. <laughs> and, and as you know, I was spending six hours every day for three years and three months visiting my dad. So the music was very important. One of the things that I learned when I, I, I gravitated toward learning, I didn't know it initially, you know, when initially when I was booked for an assistant living or something, I would just, um, just kind of go in to sing. But then I learned the importance of it. And I learned that for the first 20 to a half an hour, I just need to get them engaged. They're, they're, they're not in that mindset right away. They, they, they haven't been you know, they've been just living the normal life. So what I do, I mean, I really sing, uh, you know, upbeat songs for the first 20 minutes, a half an hour. And then all of a sudden I see them coming, you know, around and, you know, and I, I that's when I start to engage with them more and I see them um, singing along and, but it's not initially when I, when I do it. And touch a, a little bit about that because you are, um, and the, um, the, the healthcare, um, this, the, um, the, what is it called? The healthcare system. Um, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, like the nursing homes and healthcare. <laughs> Long term. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nursing home and healthcare. Talk such a little bit about that, about that, the, uh, the residents there. Sure. 
Well, I think the thing that we all know about residential care is that, um, first of all, people can, of course, be there for a long, a long time. The way that Music and Memory started, and, and the person that you talked to, Judy, was Dan Cohen, who was yes, the founder. Yes, it was right? Dan, yes. And, and he, back way back in 2006, was sort of thinking kind of idly about, you know, uh, thinking about iPods, and he wondered if he ever went to a nursing home you know, would he be able to listen to the music that he loved? And that kind of led him to try it out with a few people. And gradually he realized everything that you've been all been talking about, which is just how meaningful music can be for so many. And the great thing was as he worked and um, he was introduced to Connie who, you know, had this really rich uh, background in terms of all the ways that uh, music can be so incredibly effective and therapeutic. Um, he realized that it could affect everybody in the nursing home, including people with who had dementia, even very advanced dementia, people can respond. And um, I'm sort of chuckling when you were talking about 15 or 20 minutes, because one of the first things I learned from Connie was that it often, especially for people with dementia, but it could be anybody, including me, as far as it goes, you can take a few minutes before your mind switches you know, and you start to hear it in. And I remember um, one time when I was working in a nursing home and it was after dinner and we were bringing music into a small group of people um, who were mostly, they had some degree or another of dementia. And we went into the room and they happened to be, uh, it happened to be a home that had a lot of people with Irish background. And I'll never forget when I first went in, one of the women had a lot of dementia, the kind of dementia where she was kind of talking constantly but not making you know not understandable and I thought oh gosh she's never gonna you know she's never gonna um, get this but in the back of my mind was you know what Connie had said to me and sure enough so I started playing the music and several of the people in the room started singing along and after about 15 or 20 minutes this woman joined in and then everybody in the room so whether they had a little or a lot of dementia or no dementia everybody was together and I think that's the, you know, the real beauty is that it, 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 it can touch just about everybody. Um, and so what music and memory has been really focused on are two sort of important um, elements, if you will. One of them is to try to get it to people, particularly in nursing homes, but otherwise also, who don't have access to it otherwise. Um, and also, as we, I think, understand, there's not a lot that's personal in residential care. Music is one of those things that can be very personal. And the beauty about iPods or, you know, MP3 players or, you know, whatever vehicle we have is that you can listen to it and not bother your roommate if you have a roommate. That was always one of the confounding problems in the past. So now if you love, um, harpsichord or you love uh, heavy metal, you know, you get to hear it and you don't have to bother the person next to you. Because we all know we have favorite music and we have music that we are not so fond of. Right. I and don't believe that we had that when my dad was in the nursing home. I don't believe we had that kind of um, vehicle to yeah. listen to your own music. Yeah. And I think that, so there are kind of two pieces to this. One is getting it to people that don't otherwise have access. And the other part is, um, make, you know, the ability to make it personalized so that you get to listen to the music, um, you know, that's most personal to you. And as Connie, again, uh, taught me long ago, that there's a lot of research around the fact that the music you, we all hear between approximately the ages of 15 and 25, um, but of course, it's not, it's not exact, but um, is the music that tends to really stay in your, in your mind. And so, um, you know, I came of age in the 60s. And so a lot of 60s music, I, I know by heart, you know, and that's been a harder thing for me to do later in life. But a lot of it, if I hear it, I can sing along without any. <laughs> but I think that's pretty common, you know. So the beauty, uh, what music and memory was able to bring was really just getting music out there to more people. And that's what we work on. And um, Connie has really helped us understand and deepen the, all the different ways that music can really be um, valuable. And her 
organization, the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function, um, with all its um, clinical focus, has really um, just enriched us enormously. And of course, she's also part of Music and Memory, a founder. <laughs> So how do they, how does each person get it personalized? I mean, how does that work? Like, you know, if someone's in a hospital or in a nursing home, um, how do they go about getting it personalized? Well, there are a couple of different ways and Connie will talk about, you know, when it's really important in terms of specific therapeutic goals. In general, with the way that music and memory uh, works, um, and we've worked with a lot of state um, health departments, is that when a, when a home um, becomes certified, we teach people, um, uh, first of all, just all about the equipment and um, the access to music. And then we teach them how to be a musical detective. How do you help, how do you figure out with somebody what music that's gonna be? And obviously for somebody who can tell you, that's, you know, that's much easier. For the person with dementia, you can certainly um, talk to family members and you can find out things like, you know, was somebody active in their church? Um, uh, you know, what was their favorite, you know, what was the song played at their wedding? I mean, there are a lot of different ways you can go about it. And on our website, there is a, um, a, a, an era, a piece there that explains, you know, specifically sort of how to be a detective. But there are a lot of, and you keep trying until you get it. Um, and oftentimes it's a particular song um, or, or um, uh, uh, artist, you know, that somebody likes, for example, whether it's Frank Sinatra or the Beatles, or I happen to love um, Nat King Cole and Nina Simone. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, you know, different people, we all have different favorites and there are different ways of going about getting it. Um, if you go on our website, there's um, a wonderful little clip about a man named Henry and anybody going on the website can see it. It's about five minutes long. And he had pretty advanced dementia. Um, and when, um, and he would, but he would mostly just sit in his chair with his arms crossed, looking down. Um, when a musician came to the home, he would be in the room and he would tap his foot, you know? I mean, that would be when you would see him responding. But when they took a further step, and really figured out what music, they worked with him and with his family to figure out what music he really liked. That's when you see the impact that you can all see if you go look on our website, which is he's saying, you know, he knew it and he was responsive and he could even talk about it a little bit, which is something he never did otherwise. Now you're not gonna always have exactly that impact, but that's the, that's, that illustrates the possibilities. Connie, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, in terms of the way that music can be used in a, in a more specific clinical way? Sure. You know, there's so many applications. Once, like Ann said, once um, we know what the personalized music, what the personal uh, music is for the individual, we can also then um, create playlists for different times of the day. So, for example, in everyday care. Um, some people, you know, when they're in an institution can be sort of combative if somebody has to dress them or, or um, bathe them and having music available that uh, makes them feel relaxed actually helps reduce that agitation when somebody's uh, doing direct care. There's things like pain management that can be addressed or different types of behavioral issues that can be addressed through music that actually then help reduce the need for, you know, extra painkillers or, or a psychotropic drug for agitation. The other piece, and, and Anne, uh, you alluded to this, and Renee, you did too, they um, sometimes because of the, the brain delay, you know, the processing delay, that people with any kind of uh, neurologic um, challenge, whether it's a stroke or Parkinson's or, or Alzheimer's dementia, um, getting somebody stimulated and aroused for a period of time actually then carries over to things like their ability to talk and answer questions. So I know, I know physicians that'll do their exams after somebody's participated in the music uh, activity or listen to music, because now the person, their brain has sort of warmed up and has been um, charged enough. <laughs> That's the way it is. It's whatever electrical activity needs to be um, generated 
for that person then to be able to organize their thoughts to answer questions. And it's a really remarkable phenomenon to see, but we understand this is um, that it's the result of uh, something that grabs their attention, that holds their attention, that uh, helps them um, stimulate uh, recognition memory that then carries over to things like recall. So those are amazing um, accomplishments through something basically using personalized music. Wow. What in, in, in this past year during the pandemic, I mean, it was hard because, uh, Ian, you could touch on this because of the, uh, the not connection with someone who sings or plays an instrument. I mean, are you still active in the um, healthcare industry? Yeah. Still- yeah. So, I mean, what tools did you guys use? Because I know that around here, they were reaching out for videos, you know, videos or um, I actually created videos. I reached out to a bunch of artists. I just reached out to any artist and said, or if I saw them on Facebook sing and said, you know, can I use this to create an hour video so that I could send to uh, the nursing homes? And we, we did, but it's not the same. It's not, it's not the same connection with them, I don't think. So talk to us about how you guys handled all that stuff. Well, the, the homes that we work with, um, you know, they come to us initially for training and they become certified as a music and memory home. And that means that they um, have a number of, you know, they have the equipment and they've done the work to make a play with somebody's uh, uh, preferred playlist. And we heard back from a number of homes. In fact, just this morning, we got a note about it. Uh, a home in Illinois that talked about how much help it was to have been certified and have the equipment and be able to take to, for people to listen to their favorite music when they were in their room. Great. So that's, you know, it's one of the few things that could reach people um, when they were so isolated. Mm. And, and, and one home told us about, um, they were encouraging their staff that um, as we know, a lot of homes were using um, uh, iPads to uh, connect people with their families. And this uh, administrator told us a story about um, encouraging her staff that um, to to, um, set it up so that as the person was getting off the the iPad with their family, that they could listen to their favorite music for a while, just to ease the transition Mm -hmm. away from having to say goodbye to their family for just as one example. But Mm -hmm. we heard from many homes who said that they were so glad that they had um, the equipment and the training because it was one of the few things that could bring comfort to people. Um, And it's funny, you know, uh, I work with a home out in Phoenix who I've learned an enormous amount from Uh, because they have done uh, a huge amount of work in the area of dementia. And on their dementia unit, every once in a while, as we all know, there can be, um, you know, just uh, a certain kind of, I don't know, noisy tension that can happen every once in a while. You know, somebody's, one person is upset, it can kind of raise the whole, the whole anxiety level on the unit. And one of the things that they've learned to do over the years is play Christmas music because Christmas music is something that we all tend to listen to when we're very young. I mean, it's just something you grow up with, whether you, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, it just is around us. And they say every time it just, everybody sort of calms down. (laughs) Friend, my colleague who works out there said, she said, I have to admit, she said the staff are not wild about this, but this, but it really works beautifully and helps the residents a lot. And I noticed, this year after Christmas, after you know we're all in this um, funny isolation, um, the, uh, that I, w- I had some, a lot of work I had to do in January on a particular project that I just kept my music, my Christmas music out for a while because it was actually, I discovered, great to write to. You know? oh. <laughs> so we all find our way to different aspects of how music can be you know, good for us. So the music and memory was um, an important tool, especially yeah. during the pandemic, right? Yeah. Because you could tap into individuals listening to their music. It was a way to tap into it. That's awesome. Also, um, you know, at a certain point, very early on in April and May, um, 
you know, the, the federal government started making available to um, organizations, to nursing homes, a few tablets because they realized how important it was in terms of family visits. And so what Music and Memory did, the staff there, is they developed a training to help uh, homes who had not worked with them before on how to use them, but not only for family visits, but also um, as a great tool in helping being a detective, you, can, you could actually find and play music and try it out with folks and see what their response was. And so that was also, that was kind of an additional thing that we worked on during the pandemic that was really helpful for us and for many of our facilities. Wow, wow. Connie, do you want to share, I mean, I, I mean, we, I didn't know about Dan Cohen until today. Can you just give us a little bit of history of how it began with Dan or what, I don't know who would be better to give that information or well, maybe both you want to tap into it. And I also would like to know what Dan's doing now because I haven't seen him since about, I think 2012. Connie, well, we can say so, that he started in 2006, just idly kind of playing with the idea. And then he began to, you know, get such a wonderful response. Connie, you, you did a lot of work with him in the very beginning. Sure. So Anne, as Ann mentioned, she introduced Dan to me. I had, you know, been working, well, at that point, over 35 years, uh, both with people with dementia, but also stroke survivors. And had done a lot of research in, in music and its effect. And um, Dan was, was really interested in how to maximize the reach of, of personalized music. And, you know, with the, with the advent of MP3 players, it was a really a game changer because, you know, we had been making personalized tapes for people and it's only so much you could do right. with, with cassette tapes and, and, and records. And, you know, the internet was still, being able to use the internet was still fairly new. In, in nursing homes. Um, so D Dan actually worked with the Institute for maybe two years, I think we worked together in trying to pull together the concept of um, creating a program, a training program that could then be um, multi multiplied um, and duplicated at facilities all over the country. Um, and so those are the early sort of the, the incubation period of, of music and memory to really see how we could um, get people to understand how to be the music detective, like Ann said, to figure out how to get the best music for each individual. Also the, the uh, ways of detecting negative effects of music to really be conscious that, you know, one size doesn't fit all with music. And even if music seems to be universal, all of us have personal experiences, some of them negative with music and how to tweeze those out of, um, of a playlist. So then we got some funding from the Rubin Foundation to actually uh, build the program even further. And then Alive Inside came out, right? And, and the film, the documentary that just catapulted the whole program into prominence and still does. Um, that's people's first aha moment saying, you know, my goodness, look at what music can do. I, I knew this, but but look how powerful this is. What movie was that, Connie? Alive Inside. Alive Inside. I never saw. I got to see. Oh, it. it's fabulous. You got to you got to see it. But you know, it's funny because um, you're you're right. In I was singing, and you know, I always one of the songs in my playlist for nursing homes is "Could I Have This Dance," which is like forty five minutes into it because already I have them lifted. So I'm kind of engaging in music that they know. So, but this one time I was at a nursing home and this woman started crying and crying and it reminded her of her husband who had just passed. Yeah. So it was, you know, I, I immediately stopped because I didn't want to, you know, keep bringing her this sadness, you know, and and I just said, oh, it's time to switch, you know, we'll switch into something else, you know, but it was, you're correct. I mean, and music, you know, even me, you know, when I'm, when I'm, when something's bothering me, I put on those, those songs that lift me, that remind me of the good places that I want to go and I need to go. And I always like inspirational music. Inspirational music to me is just, you know, the words and the music. I mean, even Bon Jovi, you know, it's your life, you know. Um, you know, just songs that get you out of that space, you know, because 
life is hard enough. And especially when you have an illness or dementia or a stroke or something, I mean, you have to tap into something that's going to, going to bring you joy at that particular moment in your life. Yeah. Situations like that, when, um, when there is somebody who has a very emotional response to a piece of music, you know, usually we'll have, we'll work with them individually with that song to let them uh, have those feelings and, and to embrace those feelings in a, in a very careful way. So yeah. the person can, can deal with them and let them out, you know, but it, like you said, it's, it's good to balance it too, with things that are uplifting. So we sort of need a, a bit of both. Yeah. I don't think that me as an entertainer, um, it wasn't because I don't think they knew what they were feeling. Like they knew, right. but they needed someone to help them. Yeah. So you did absolutely, the, you did the right thing. You know absolutely. what I'm saying? Because yeah. my job is to uplift them, to bring them joy. And that's why one time a dear friend of mine had said to me, I'll pay you any amount of money you want to come work at this nursing home. And I prayed on it and I thought about it and I honestly declined because I wanted to keep my, my vision and my, um, my intention for entering into a nursing home for an hour, uplifting them yeah. and then going away and then coming back. Cause the other thing is, I don't know if you both agree with this, but the other thing is it takes a while for the um, residents to start to engage and know the songs that you do. That's why I do a, a, a complete, you know, I, I may change the, I may change the order around because of the day, but it's important for you because they like to sing along. They like to get to, to a familiar. They like that. So yeah, I've been, I've been performing at a, a before the pandemic at a number of nursing homes for years, you know, because that's, you know, the, the, the work it's, I mean, most people, would think, oh, you sing in the nursing home, but it's big, it's bigger than that. Our job is, it, is. Really, it really is an important, um, an important part. I mean, we, I don't know, like I said, I don't know the, um, the medical side, I don't know the professional side, but I do know what it takes to um, bring joy to people. And that's, you know, that's, that's what I know. And I, I would have been in a good place right now if I would have <laughs> <laughs> taking that job but it doesn't matter <laughs> um, so um we were talking about dan and did you have anything you wanted to share no, I didn't. so we only have a few more minutes and i really want to you know uh, make sure that people know about the music in memory um you know what what's one thing that you know you included judy would want to everybody to share like let's do a recap on the show because you know sometimes we talk and we talk and talk and lose the perspective of our intention and really the intention of this show would to show how important music is and 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 the work that music and memory is doing to help them um so uh judy why don't you start why don't you start with your your uh, vision and your intention of doing this show the reason that I wanted to do this show is that I never forgot the impression I got attending that conference and knowing that I actually participated in music and memory years before I met Dan. And I recall how the singers, two of which I still um, see from time to time, would come out into the audience and talk or sing to an individual person. And the liveliness of that person once they were addressed was something to really smile about. Mm -hmm. To know that you're really getting to that person and you're really making them happy and you're making them very comfortable. And looking back, I feel that what I was doing, I just did out of natural feelings I wanted to make my dad comfortable. I even put on his TV when I was leaving or I told the nursing staff that I did not want at any time for my dad to be sitting by the nursing station with the wheelchairs and all that. I didn't want that. I wanted him out of bed, sitting in a wheelchair, watching TV or listening to music. Hmm. 
And I had an answering machine next to his bed. He could not reach over. He was paralyzed on the left side. But when I left, I told him, when I get home, I'll call you. And I, when I got home in the evening, I would call and say, Dad, I'm home. And he would answer. I wouldn't know that he's answering, but the nurses in his room would say, my God, he's answering. And he's saying, thank you for coming. And I enjoyed your company. And thank you for the music. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I'll never forget when my father was in ICU a number of times, a three-year you know, really journey that we were on with my father. Um, we even he when he was sedated, we had um, the music on. We had especially Natalie Cole Love. We had that song playing all the time because we want, and we know we heard it. We know we heard it. Oh yes. So I, I want to just say something to that because very later on, just before he passed, he was in a coma, and I was. It was Father's Day, and I was reading poems and sayings from a book about the daughter's love for her dad and playing music in the background, and he was squeezing my hand. Yeah. So I do believe even if you're in a coma, you can hear this. Yeah, yeah. Fun. Yeah. And Connie, before we get to yours and Anne's vision, I mean, when someone suffers a stroke, that's neurological. Um, so and this is as important for a stroke as it is for dementia or Alzheimer's. Or sure. In fact, a lot of my work has been in, in stroke rehab, um, having people who have aphasia. So non-fluent aphasia actually can uh, do very well in recovering speech through singing. It's a, a program that we do and very much involved with. And people with Parkinson's disease um, move better to music, so all types of neuro rehabilitation is enhanced through music cueing. And so that's a whole other program on, yeah. on, on, we'll on speech and that. sing. <laughs> yeah. We'd love for you to come back and talk about that because- Just aphasia yeah. and singing and, and speech recovery. Yeah. That'll be another sure. topic I will talk to you about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. because, you know, like I said, with, um, you know, with um, the, uh, with the residents, how it, takes a little bit of time for people to engage. It's the same thing in our world. Like we, Absolutely. And that's why we just did a wonderful program, which Jim and Judy were, you know, leaders in it, um, you know, called Let's Keep the Conversation Alive. Yeah. And and we're so proud of it. We had and moving people. forward. Yeah, we had we had like 30 people on mm -hmm. the screen at the same time. And I'll send you just who was on it. It was dynamic. And I know that at that particular time, it didn't really give each person an opportunity to share too much information. But I wanted what people what my intention for that program was to show people the 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 number of um, parts pieces to the puzzle that it takes for recovery and for your health, you know, and it, we were, I was so proud of it. Judy and Jim, it was, it was, it was incredible. We enjoyed it also. And it's on my Facebook page. It's on the very top. Of, I pinned it. So you can also so what we're see gonna, it. Judy Morrow of Facebook. What we're going to do the next time around, and I hope you'll join us on this, is we're going to, we're going to break it up now. We're going to do aphasia. We're going to do strokes. We're going to do recovery. We're going to do caregivers. Um, so we're going to break it up and have different, have hours for each individual group to be able to share a little, keep the conversation going. But it was so important to have not just everybody coming together. People were amazed by it and so proud of it. So we, we loved it. I hope you'll join us. So Connie, go ahead. Tell us a little bit um, about what, what you would like for people to remember about the music in memory. That music helps us stay connected and it gives care partners, family members, a way to stay connected to somebody, even when, because of a neurologic um, challenge, they feel that they've lost their loved one. So I want to tell everybody that that person still recognizes and has a sense of connection that can be shared through music. And so finding their personal music, listening to it together and sharing those moments are precious and something that you could still take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Anne? I would say absolutely confirming what all of you have said, but also to add that I think 
it's so important to get music to people where they are, even, you know, um, uh, whether they're in residential care or group homes, but they really can benefit tremendously. And, um, and the spectrum of people it can reach is endless. It's really important to understand that, that somebody may, and we've seen it often, be unresponsive to anything else and they can still respond to music. Wow. Kali, I know that you're internationally known for research and clinical applications of music and neurology for rehabilitation. Um, does this music and memory go around the world? Do, do, do other uh, countries tap into it? Sure. I mean, Music and Memory as an organization was um, actually spearheaded the um, Music and Memory programs around the world. And Ben could talk more specifically about how they differ because there's other organizations that have sort of taken up the, um, the challenge of building that program within their country. Right, right. But, but it is international for sure. Well, we would love to have Dan on the program as well. Um, could he- you connect me with Dan? Could you send me an email or talk to Dan? Because I did meet him um, in a conference and I don't know if he remembers or not, but he was the reason that I continued telling people about music and memory. Certainly, we're happy to do that. So that's great. Thank you so much. You know, like I said in our uh, last show, let's keep the conversation going. This is only the first time that we're going to really tap into how important music is. And I hope one day to be able to go back to um, performing on each show, because like I was saying to uh, Ann and Connie and uh, Judy knows, of course, um, that, um, you know, Kelly Clarkson, I remember when she they were talking in discussions about her program. And she said, well, the one thing that I want to do is to sing because that's how I speak, you know, and that's why I want to begin the show. And if you go back seven years ago, that's what we were doing. We were always had music and singing on the program, whether it was myself, I always sang on each program, but we always, the music is so important. So Renee, important. do you, does um, Jim have the music to um, that video now? No, no, let's, let's, I'll, I'll add it into the clip when I, okay, when I download good. it, I'll add it in. So it doesn't Very matter, good. but, but I want to share one last thing on October 3rd, um, 2021, we're doing our, um, our seventh telethon and, and that's music. Music is a language of love. It's, it just lifts people up and, and Jim is going to be a huge sponsor this year of we're in discuss, we're in discussion with it. And, um, and we're, we're so honored and privileged to have had Connie and Ann on the show today. Thank you so much for your time because we know how valuable time is, especially during this pandemic. You know, it's funny. People would think we're working less and we're working more. (laughs) That's true. We're working around (laughs) the clock, you know, they're thinking, oh, you're working from home or you're, um, (laughs) or, you know, you can't go out and, but it's, it's, it's been insane, crazy busy. So um, thank you so much to both of you. And Judy, of course, thank you to you for everything you do. Without you, this program would not be on. Judy has a wonderful um, schedule of shows for the next few weeks. And thank you to Jim in the studio for, for, we love you, Jim. We couldn't do it without you either. So thank you so much. So we're going to, we're going to, we always blow our kisses. I don't know if you would like to join us, but we're going to thank everybody for joining us. And we have another show coming up um, with Steve Gutman, um, who is a wonderful individual. Um, He teaches uh, how exercise and what's the, um, what's the program? Guy Gong. Guy Gong. Um, (laughs) I think it's a slow moving. Is it Japanese? The slow moving? Well, well, Steve will tell us uh, exactly about it. But um, he, that's another healthcare um, uh, recovery, um, really different format that, that taps into um, keeping us alive and keeping us healthy. Um, so we can't wait for Steve to come on. And thank you once again, Judy and Ian. Thank you to Jim and Judy. And let's blow our kisses. One, two, three. Bye, everybody. Bye, God bless you all. Yo no sé qué tú piensas. Yo no sé lo que haré. Yo no sé lo que estoy perdiendo. Yo no sé lo que va a pasar.
passar.